embark on a journey of inspiration and discovery with the Purdue Lecture Hall Series, proudly presented by the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Diseases. Join us as we delve into the remarkable odysseys of these aspiring scientists, each crafting their own narrative in the world of science and groundbreaking research. Take a glimpse into their diverse cultural backgrounds and the journeys that brought them to Purdue University. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Welcome everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm Director of Scientific Strategy and Relations for the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology and Infectious Disease. And today on our Purdue Lecture Hall series, I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Lauren Stachinsky, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Biological Sciences here at Purdue University. Uh, Dr. Stachinsky is working with Dr. Stephanie Gardner on a collaborative project collecting information on the ways undergraduate students construct and interpret graphs. In addition to being passionate about how students learn quantitative reasoning skills. Lauren also conducts research as a freshwater ecologist using a broad range of techniques to understand human influences on aquatic organisms. In her talk, she will discuss her journey to Purdue, talk about some cool ecotoxicology research and discuss some of the education work being conducted here at Purdue. With that, I want to welcome you to the program, Lauren. Thank you so much for coming on and telling us all about your journey, all about your research. I got to tell you, I'm very excited to have you on the show because you are the first person that is not only going to talk a little bit about your scientific research, but the first person that now has uh, this opportunity to take a view at the educational process and science education and all of that. So I think, you know, for me, it's very exciting to learn about this. Uh, and I hope that the audience also will see this as a potential career option for them as well. Yes, that's part of why I wanted to do this. I felt um, that it's you can be a scientist, but then as all scientists in academia, we we teach and we interact with students daily. So learning a little bit about the research behind that, I think hopefully will be interesting to folks. Well, without further ado, please take the stage. I'm going to turn myself off and mute myself so that you can go ahead and take the spotlight. We're looking forward to it. Awesome. All right. So I'll share my screen here. Awesome. Okay, yeah. So you know, my name is uh, Dr. Lauren Stachinsky. I also go by Dr. Stosh, just because again, my last name is long in Polish and sometimes people have trouble pronouncing it. I wanted to start off today's talk by, again, introducing myself and talking a little bit about who I am and my journey to where I've gotten so far. Um, so I consider myself a freshwater biologist, but as I talk about a little bit later, I've really gotten into education research as well. So I kind of have these two halves of my research identity. Um, I played fast pitch softball for about 16 years. It was a instrumental part of my life that I played in high school. I played in college, and I also got to play a little bit in grad school as well, which was unexpected, but um, was very welcome. Um, I am slightly obsessed with giraffes, so I'll talk about research with fish, but I really ultimately also really like giraffes, and so I collect anything related to giraffes. I've gotten into disc golf, so obviously I don't play softball anymore right now. Maybe I'll get into slow pitch when I end up wherever my final career takes me, um, but my husband got me into disc golf, and so uh, there are a lot of awesome courses here around Purdue. Uh, we tend to play weekly when the weather cooperates. Um, so it's something that I've gotten very passionate about. I, uh, I mentioned my husband, uh, we got married actually two days after I graduated with my uh, my PhD at Clemson. And so this is a you know, picture graduation and then wedding day slightly after that. We have two fur babies. So we have Sunshine who is our orange tabby. And then we have Elsa who is a Siamese. 
So initially, when my academic journey starts, obviously in my hometown, I'm from Erie, Pennsylvania, and I always actually wanted to be a marine biologist, which, you know, living next to Great Lake might be surprising. And, you know, reflecting back on that now, I am sad that I didn't appreciate the freshwater systems as much as I definitely do now. Uh, so it would be cool at some point to head back to my hometown and actually do some research or look at all of the streams that are surrounding my hometown just because I didn't I was a person that would go into the creek and like look for critters and stuff like that but I didn't like fully appreciate that as a career opportunity I was really focused on like oh saving the coral reefs and wanting to be like a shark scientist instead of you know honing in on kind of what was directly around me. And so if you've never been to the Great Lakes, I highly suggest it. Um, again, being at Purdue, it's a short drive north to go to Lake Michigan. Um, and I would say all the Great Lakes kind of have this effect on you where they really do look like an ocean, but it is fresh water. And so Lake Erie is situated where the sun actually sets over the lake. And so we get these really awesome sunsets. But of course, the flip side of that is in times like now, uh, you can also get these lake effect bands that will come off the lake and just dump tons of snow on you. So, you know, two sides of a coin. My undergraduate degree was at Westminster College. This is a small liberal arts school about an hour and a half south of Erie in a small town called New Wilmington, Pennsylvania. My degree was simply in biology um, because the small schools, they don't usually have all the fancy sub degree like Purdue has. Um, but I got this well-rounded biology degree. And while I was at Westminster, you have to complete a capstone project. So this is where I kind of got into the toxicology aspect of my research. Uh, I did uh, some research with zebrafish and looking at their development after exposing them to um, pesticides and fertilizers. I actually didn't know about toxicology until uh, my mom, who a, is a biology teacher, she's retired now, um, but she taught biology. She went to a lecture that was happening at one of the universities in Erie and was like, Lauren, there's this cool field called environmental toxicology, and I feel like you should check it out. And I was like, oh, okay, like I'll look into it because I was having trouble getting into grad school going the marine biology route. And so instead I found this awesome advisor down at Clemson who worked in environmental toxicology. And so that ended up being where I ended up going for graduate school. So going all the way from up in Pennsylvania down to South Carolina, where I spent the next eight years of my life. Um, so South Carolina actually has no man has no natural lakes. All of them are man-made. And Clemson just happens to be on one of these man-made lakes, Lake Hartwell. And so this is Lake Hartwell. This is probably one of the quintessential pictures of Clemson besides its football stadium because Clemson is a football school. Um, and so I spent eight years here. My master's degree is in environmental toxicology. And so that took me three years. I'm not going to talk too much about that research, but it dealt with pharmaceuticals and bass and predatory behavior. And it does tie into some of the work that I will talk about uh, today. But ultimately, once I was finishing up my master's degree, I was like, well, I kind of really like fish. I know I like fish and I do like toxicology, but I really wanted to incorporate ecology into my toxicology. So I was like, I just want to focus on ecology for my PhD. So uh, a new professor was on campus, Dr. Brandon Peoples. I met with him in his office and I was like, hey, like, I would like to do an ecology-esque PhD, but... I would be staying basically in the biology department because he was in a different department. So I was asking him to be my co-advisor basically. And so he said, yes. And so I ended up doing this project that was very computational, which I also really want to talk about today because it is complicated and I still sometimes have trouble talking about it with a lay audience. That's why I chose not to talk about it in this talk. But it was ultimately just looking at what are the ways that humans at a broad scale impact stream fish communities. And so this idea of this human umbrella is what ends up becoming part of my main research identity even now. And it brings in the toxicology with the ecology into this ecotox realm. And so that's some of the work that I will talk about today that I did do in Clemson with some undergraduate students. I'm really passionate about doing research with undergraduates 
And I'm hoping that I'll get to continue that um, as part of my career. And so obviously now I am a postdoctoral researcher here at Purdue University. I work with Dr. Stephanie Gardner. And I will back up a minute and say that at Clemson, I had the opportunity to do a teaching certificate. So it was something aside from my PhD because I'm very passionate about teaching and I was a teaching assistant my entire time, my entire eight years at Clemson. And so uh, being a teaching assistant and teaching these undergraduates, I got really passionate about it. And I was like, this is kind of what I wanna do with my career. Like I do like research. And as I'll talk about, I really like doing research with undergraduates, but I really like teaching. And I think I got that bug again. My mom was a biology teacher, but she taught high school students. And I don't really want to teach high school students. I really want to teach college students. And so um, I'm hoping that my next career step will allow me to do that. And so doing this teaching certificate introduced me to the scholarship of teaching and learning, which is where instructors basically don't just teach, but they kind of teach with this scholarly aspect of trying to understand how their students are learning, using literature-based practices to help students learn better. And so I was like, wow, this is a really cool avenue of research. I want to do this and do ecology. And so that's where I was like, well, if I go do a postdoc, I really want to gain these skills in education research. And so that's where I kind of seeked Stephanie out because they were doing this project with quantitative reasoning skills, which as a teaching assistant, I noticed that a lot of the undergraduates at Clemson and talking to faculty, this is kind of true across the board, students come into college and they struggle with these quantitative reasoning skills. How to use Excel, how to make a graph, how to interpret graphs. What, why do we aggregate data into a mean? Why do we have different sample sizes? All of these experimental things that students need to know to be a scientist, and even lay people, like our non-science majors need to know this because graphs are everywhere. A lot of times you're looking at the news, they'll pop a graph up when they're talking about something. Well, you need to be able to read that graph so that you can interpret the data for yourself and not just listen to someone interpreting it. And so coming to, com coming to Purdue here, I was really excited to jump into this project, um, looking at how students make graphs, interpret graphs. And then I specifically started looking at this aspect of variability and how do students interpret variability in a graphing context. And so that's a little bit about what I'll talk about later on. Um, but again, I am a broadly trained freshwater ecologist. I typically work with streamfish, but I also am pretty into aquatic macroinvertebrates. As a fish biologist, I'm always asked, what's your favorite fish? Which is a really loaded question. I have like them broken down into categories. So we will talk about some of my favorite fish later on that I've worked with. But one of the one of my favorite fish that you can typically see at an aquarium that is not native to North America is the archer fish, which is pick, depicted here. They're a really cool fish because they actually have to use physics and math to squirt water to catch bugs that are on, you know, overhanging trees or aquatic vegetation that's hanging over the water. So there's a bug on there and you can see that they'll squirt the water, the bug falls in the water, then they can eat it. But there's that little like refraction between when they're in the water and out of water. So they have to like do math and physics. And I think that's crazy for a fish. And again, I really like aquatic macroinvertebrates. Um, these are some dragonflies. So not everyone always realizes that these common insects that we're familiar with actually spend most of their lives in fresh water. Dragonflies are just one example. The adults, you know, they come out in the spring when they're when they're ready and they're there for the whole summer, but they could spend up to three years actually in the fresh water systems before they become an adult. And so these are different instars or molts of, of one species of dragonfly. And again, I've completed work across scale. So I talked about my PhD being this computational work uh, this is just one of those data sets that I played with. So if you are somebody that really likes to play with data, doing computational like modeling ecology is something you might might be really interested in. And today we're kind of in this era of big data. It's really easy for researchers to compile their data from you know collaborators and usually a lot of 
state agencies have been collecting data for years. So there's these big data sets that are out there that are just waiting for people to play with them and ask ecological questions. And again, I have this ecotoxological background that we'll get into. I have experience with lab and field studies. We'll talk a little bit about that today as well. And this experience with biology education research with which delves into both data literacy and critical thinking. And I'll spend most of my time on, on that aspect. So I have a couple of background slides just to kind of prime everyone for the, the ecotox work that I'm gonna talk about. And I wanna just start off with briefly chatting about what a community is. So I think everyone has this idea of what a community is and it's this group of organisms that are all living in the same place. But we have to think about these multiple species and the fact that they're all gonna be from different taxa. So in this wetland community here, we have fungi, we have midges, we have bacteria. Then we have things that we typically think of, you know, reptiles, fish, birds, mammals. All of these things make up a community, including the plants. And this includes multiple trophic levels. So a trophic level is gonna be those different layers of the food web. So you have, you know, the amphipods that get eaten by the fish, that get eaten by the turtles, or that get eaten by the birds. And so there's this interconnection of these different species within the community. And lastly, we can't think about a community without thinking about the interactions between the species. So it's not just predator-prey interactions, but it could be mutualistic interactions. Maybe there are some different fish species that actually interact with each other in a positive manner. And when scientists study communities, they can do so at some different dimensions. And I'm gonna talk about two of them just because they kind of tie into um, the ecotox work I'm gonna talk about. The first is taxonomic diversity, which I think most people automatically think of when you're studying a community, you wanna know how many species are present in that community or how many genera are present in that community. And so I have a Great Lakes fishes example here. And so if we counted up all the fishes on this poster, we would see that this particular community has 35 species. So knowing how many species are there and even sometimes knowing the abundances. So is there one or two species that dominate this community or do all these species kind of have an equal play in the community is also something that ecologists are interested in. The other dimension is functional diversity. And this is the different traits that fish have in this instance that allow them to fit within the community. And so we can think about spawning traits. So some fish species, they'll just lay their eggs on the bottom and then they'll leave them alone. They won't ever touch them again. Some have parental care. So they'll build nests and the males will guard the nests. So there's different functional traits that each fish species has. And so there's different requirements that each species has then to live in a community. There's also these kind of morphological traits that we can have. A really common one would be body depth, uh, a ratio of body depth to, to length. And this just allows us to say like how streamlined is a fish. And so this could relate to uh, how much flow the fish needs to survive. Can it be in a really fast moving stream or river or does it need to be in more of a slow moving um, stream or river? And so one of the questions that I really got interested in when doing my dissertation work was this idea of the movement of species. And so this ties into that functional traits, but there's not a lot of research on functional traits for movement or dispersal of these small non-game species. Yes, we know a lot. There's a lot of research being done on these charismatic commercially relevant species such as sturgeon, salmon, shad, because we eat them and they make big migrations. So it's very obvious that they're moving around and contributing in different ways to the ecosystem. But those make up a very small percentage of all of the fish that are out there. And so I'm interested in knowing what's going on with all these very small body fishes. I don't think that they're gonna move around as much as these big migratory species, but they're still moving around within their environment. And that should make a difference in interactions in the community. And so this part of my work that I'm gonna talk about today was not possible 
without my four undergraduates that I worked with at Clemson. And so we have Allison here. She helped me with a large chunk of project and then her and the other three. So we have Morgan, Maddie and Rachel. They helped with the lab part part of the experiment. And Allison helped a lot with the field portion that I'll talk about. And this research was funded by the South Carolina Water Resources Center, as well as Clemson's Creative Inquiry Program. And Creative Inquiry is just a program that Clemson offers that allows undergraduate students to do research experiences with faculty and graduate students. So let's get into the fish. We had some species of interest that we were focused on. And again, these are what we would consider non-game small-bodied fishes. And when I say small-bodied, it's because they don't get like those big musky or again salmon that people like to catch or big bass. Um, while some of these species can get pretty big, like the northern hog sucker, I mean, big adults can can be pretty big. We don't eat these fish. So again, they're considered non-game fish. So we have our rosy face chub, creek chub, bluehead chub, yellowfin shiner, and then northern hog sucker and striped jump rock. So if we're looking at functional traits with these fish, the northern hog suckers and the striped jump rock are benthic species. So they have terminal mouths. We call them suckers because as you can see with the northern hog sucker, they can extrude their mouths and they like, they're like little vacuums. They go around on the bottom of the creek and they're uh, looking for aquatic insects, detritus. We have the creek chubs and the bluehead chubs are omnivorous. So they pretty much eat whatever. And they're not super restricted into different types of habitat. And what I mean by that is they create their own nests for, uh, for reproduction. And then there are other species like the yellowfin shiners who like to spawn over gravel, who can rely on these species because the bluehead chub especially, th this is one of my favorite fish, is a cool species because it carries rocks in its mouth and it creates these mound nests that other species besides the bluehead chub will use for reproduction and we call them nest associates. And so the yellowfin shiner is one of those nest associates. And so in the lab study that I'll talk about, we're focusing on three of these species that kind of, the yellowfin shiners are very small. They don't get more than about two inches in length. Uh, whereas the bluehead chubs, they can get pretty big, but not as big as the suckers can get. So it's kind of small, medium, large fish. And so this first part is going to look at quantifying fish movement in their environment. And again, I worked with several undergraduates where Allison was probably the main student I worked with. We worked over the summer of 2021 sampling sites and completing this research. And then as we got into fall semester, I wanted to continue sampling. And so I worked with a couple of other undergraduates so that Allison could focus on some other, other aspects of the project. And so I mentioned that this study was done around Clemson. So the university is right here. And we can see that there's four different sites. They each, the one, I would say the one outlier site ended up being the Six Mile Creek because it was a much wider creek than the other three. But these are all uh, first or second order weightable streams, which means you can walk across them. And we conducted a mark recapture study. And so what this means is we spend time shocking fish. So there's this cool device, it's called an electro fisher. A lot of people tend to say it looks like, like a Ghostbusters backpack. And so that's what's on my back right now. And the way these work is you have a probe, which you can see in my hand, and that probe has a lever. And so if you were to press that lever down, uh, the shocker lets out an electric current into the water. And so there's obviously a metal probe on the one I'm holding. And then there's what we call a tail. So that's the anode that completes the circuit basically. And so you have like this, I would say it's about a five and a half foot radius around me that I would be shocking. And when I say shocking, what we're doing is stunning the fish. So we're not killing the fish. We, you set the settings of the shocker so you don't want to kill the fish. But one thing to remember is these functional traits that fish have. So some fish can be more sensitive than others to the shocking process. And so we kind of have to find that sweet spot where we're catching all the fish species that we're interested in um, but again, it's just a stun and net. So we stun them, we net them, and then we put them in a bucket so that we can um, we can tag them. So after we catch the fish at a site that do not have pit tags, uh, we're gonna insert a pit tag into them. And so a pit tag is a passive integrated transponder. 
it's this small device here. I'm going to skip forward a picture. So it's that we were using the smallest ones you could get. They're eight millimeter tags. They are a little bit bigger than a grain of rice. And so we take length and weight of all of our fish. We mark what species they are. And then you take a small scalpel and you can just make a really tiny incision um, down past the anal fin, so on the, 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 the posterior end of the fish. And you basically just insert the pit tag. And if you've ever held a fish, you'll know they're kind of slimy. And that slimy coating on the fish is actually has antibacterial properties, kind of like you know having our own, our own skin as a defense mechanism. That's what the fish use. They have their skin and their scales, and then they have this slimy coating. And so the incision I make is so small that really you can just, you pop the pit tag in, you, I would press their slimy layer over the incision, and then the incision heals in about a day. And so then we can put them back in another bucket. We let them recover because they are anesthetized at this point. So they're kind of, and put, we put them to sleep. And so when they wake back up, we had a spot in each of the creeks where we would release the fish and we would come back every three weeks to see where the fish had moved around. So we had these transects, they were oh, about 500 meters and they were broken into 10 meter segments. So as we were shocking, if we caught a fish, we could wave this pit tag reader over them. So it's like this wand and it'll basically pick up the pit tag. So every pit tag has its own number that would show up on the screen. And so if we had a pit tag, we would write down the, the number and what segment we found that fish in. If the fish did not have a pit tag, they would be put in the bucket to get a pit tag. And we continue this process basically until we ran out of pit tags. So we did this again across the four different sites. And so we ended up tagging about 1,500 fish. And this is just some numbers to show uh, our species breakdown. So in our four sites, creek chubs and bluehead chubs were very abundant. And obviously bluehead chubs kind of, they win here. They're very, very abundant. And so, and they were also present at all four of our sites. So in our graph here, we have the percent recaptured on the y-axis and we have fish species on the x-axis. And this is just showing us the percent recaptured for each species across our four sampling sites. We did end up recapturing across all sites, 686 fish, which was a recapture percentage of around 45%, which if you look in the literature is actually pretty good. Um, I think anything over 15%, people are usually like, yeah, that's great. Um, and again, this could be because Again, these species aren't moving a ton, but they're still moving. And so as long as our transects are long enough, uh, we should be able to recapture at least some of them at some point. And so we can see again, rosy face chubs had the least amount. They were actually very sensitive to the shocking. Um, and we couldn't adjust it too much more or we wouldn't be able to catch the creek chubs or the bluehead chubs because they're very not sensitive. So it was like shock net or they run away. Um, so again, trying to find that that special balance between between them. So if we look at the movement of our fish species, again, we have fish species on the x-axis and the average distance traveled on the y-axis. And we did see some differences. So my undergraduate, uh, she ran a Kruskal Wallace test because again, this is what we consider non-parametric data doesn't have a normal distribution. So that bell-shaped curve that everyone wants to see in your data, you don't usually get that with ecological data, let alone behavioral data. And so we have to use a non-parametric test. It basically just looks for differences uh, between the species in, in the average distance traveled. And we can see that striped jump rock traveled the least. So out of those that we did recapture, we tended to recapture them right around the same few segments that we were that we kept capturing them from the previous time. Those that tended to move the most, northern hog suckers, and there is a cool story where we did have a chance to go kind of beyond the end of our transects because I was just curious like are there fish hanging out like just beyond the end the edge of where we stopped sampling? And there were a couple of instances where we did find northern hog suckers that were, you know, 100 meters to 150 meters past our transects. So this species in particular probably moves quite a bit, and we probably weren't totally capturing that with the study as we had designed it here. So it would be interesting to kind of go back and look at that some more. 
the elephant shiners, I think, are also interesting. Again, they're a very small fish, but they showed evidence of moving quite a bit, especially within a 500-meter transect. And a lot of times when we found fish that had moved, it was for spawning purposes. So we did come across several instances where fish were spawning and there were tagged individuals in this spawning group and they had moved several hundred meters upstream or downstream from where we had previously captured them or released them. There were some site specific differences too, since that data I just showed you was all fish from all the sites put together. And so bluehead chubs and yellowfin shiners did show some differences between the different sites. Todd's Creek had the least amount of movement. And this site was very interesting because it was very rocky and there were a lot of waterfall sections within this site. So we almost had like a lower section and an upper section of our transect to get the 500 meters because there was this waterfall section in the middle. And then the bottom half of our transect was a road crossing or a bridge and the upper part of our transect was another waterfall. So there was not a ton of places for these fish to move if they were going to stay and not like just go over the waterfall. And some of them maybe can't jump over the waterfalls. We think the yellowfin shiners can, and depending on how steep the waterfall is, the bluehead chubs potentially can too. Um, but for the most part, we were finding our lower segment fish in the lower segment and our upper segment fish in the upper segment. And then Pike, the Pike Road Creek um, showed a lot of movement, uh, though it's not statistically significant, but that site was a lot, I would consider a lot more open. Like the watershed was not compounded by uh, waterfalls or anything that would really impede the fish moving if they really wanted to. So then if we get into some of the other ecotox work, this is gonna specifically look at some fluoxetine exposure with those three sp species that I mentioned, the bluehead chub, the striped jump rock, and the elephant shiner. And Alice uh, Morgan, my undergraduate, worked a lot with me and she's still working with me on this. So why fluoxetine? Fluoxetine is an SSRI, which is a selective uh, reuptake inhibitor, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And so basically one of the modes of action or the way this drug can work is it blocks a receptor in your synapse. So you have neurons and where the neurons come together, you have a, a very small gap and that's called the synapse. And so this drug can block a receptor that would reuptake serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter that gets released. It's commonly associated with, you know, good moods, feeling, feeling good. And so the idea is if you block the reuptake, you have more serotonin in your synapse, which for an antidepressant is supposed to make people feel better, not feel as depressed if you have more serotonin available within your synapse. And of course, this is just one mode of action for these drugs. They're are potential other ones that are not understudied and not well understood, but this is the one way that uh, we think that these drugs work. And fluoxetine is the fourth most prescribed antidepressant in the U.S. as of 2022, so it's relevant because these drugs get into aquatic systems. And one of the ways that that happens is through wastewater treatment plants. So when individuals take antidepressants, or any drugs for that matter, you do metabolize the drug, but you don't always metabolize all of it. And so when you pee, you're excreting not only metabolites, but also parent compound. And wastewater treatment plants aren't totally well equipped to remove 100% of these drugs from waters. So they get released back into the environment. Even if at small concentrations, if this does happens chronically, we can get what we call sublethal effects within organisms. So the organisms aren't dying, but it's potentially impeding them in ways that maybe keep them from reproducing, which again could lead to um, population and community consequences. There's also these instances where people just flush their drugs down the toilet and you're not supposed to do that, um, but some people still do that. So for this part of the of the talk, we're gonna talk about collecting and dosing the fish. So we collected the fish in the same way. We went out and electroshocked. We brought the fish back to the lab and we let them acclimate in tanks. 
And then we dose them with the fluoxetine in a slow release implant. And you can see the needle here. It has the mixture of fluoxetine and coconut oil. And this just allows us to insert and it creates this soft bolus within the fish. So if you've ever worked with coconut oil, you'll know that at high temperatures, it's a liquid at kind of room temperature and colder temperatures, it's kind of this soft solid. So it's not going to pierce the fish organs or anything like that, but it at least has this soft bolus that forms inside the fish. And the idea is that it then slowly releases the contaminant within the fish. And here we used fish mazes. So we have the maze here with its six arms. There's this area where we would have a door down. So in this, the image on the right, you can see the doors are down. And this created a little holding area that we would put the fish in and the fish would stay there for about five minutes. Then we would raise the doors and we're recording the fish. You can see the GoPro cameras at the top here, recording the fish for 30 minutes. Once the recording is done, we're gonna euthanize the fish and we're gonna take some tissue samples. So we tried to sex the fish as much as possible, looking for gonads, see whether they're male or female. We took blood samples to get plasma. We took liver samples and also brain samples. I'm not gonna to talk too much about the tissue samples today, but I did wanna talk a little bit about the behavioral um, data that we collected. And so if I go back to our fish mazes, some of the behavioral data that we collected was the time it took the fish to leave the holding area. At what point did it cross that threshold? How many maze arms did the fish use? How many total maze lengths did the fish use? And then directional changes. And what I mean by a directional change is if a fish is moving in one direction and then say it's in the middle of an arm and it changes and totally starts swimming the opposite direction. We call that a directional change. We, we did not count directional changes if it was at the end of or the beginning of the maze, only if it was in the middle of the maze. And so if we look at some of this data, we had two different treatment groups. We had our control that were not exposed to fluoxetine. We had a low treatment group, which was exposed to four micrograms per gram of fluoxetine. And then we had a high treatment group that was exposed to 25 micrograms per gram of fluoxetine. And so in each of these graphs, I'm showing you bluehead chubs are on the left, yellowfin shiners are on the right. The colors will show you the concentration group. And we completed this experiment over five days. So after we injected the fish, we waited 24 hours for day one, then we waited for three days and then for five days. And we would take a collection of these fish and we would put them in the mazes, euthanize them and collect tissue samples. And so we're gonna be looking at the time to leave the holding area is the behavior we're gonna look at here. So with behavioral data, I think it's good to show all of the data because we wanna make sure that we're being transparent about our experiments. And so here you can see that with behavioral data, we tend to get a lot of variability in our data, which is another reason we like to show all of the data. So you can see all the data points and then the black shapes represent the mean of that data. And so for the bluehead chubs, if we wanna look at statistics, these numbers here at the top are Kruskal wallace tests again. And we always as scientists use this benchmark of 0 0.05 as meaning significance. But sometimes if you're getting really close to it, especially with behavioral data, you can at least say that we're leaning towards significance. So for these day one fish, there is some potential significance leaning towards significance between the control and the low group. And what this is showing is that the uh, treatment fish in the low group actually left the holding area faster than the control fish. At day five, we also see significance between the control group and the high group, where again, the high group left the holding area faster than the control fish. So the second the door was up, the fish were heading out into the maze a lot faster than the control fish. So this could be an indication that um, the antidepressant maybe makes the fish more bold. They're not holding back and waiting as much if they're not exposed as the not exposed fish. For the elephant shiners, we also see a similar trend in the data. So if we look at the day five data, we can see that the control group takes a little bit longer to leave on average, but
the holding area than the um, than the low the low group. And then on day three, we also potentially see again across all the days, we do see a, a sim similar trends. Um, and day three shows some potential significance, not quite past that threshold, but getting really close to it. The other behavioral data I picked to show today was the number of directional changes. And so again, these graphs are set up in the same, the same way. So if we look at bluehead chubs, we can see that at day five, the high treatment group is showing more directional changes than the control. And we see the opposite trend actually for the elephant shiners. So if we look at day five, we see that the high treatment group is showing less directional changes in the control and it's trending towards significant. But there is a significant difference between the low and the high treatment groups. And so what does this mean when it comes to the fishes moving around and their exploratory behavior? Well, I feel like it's up to the species. So there's potential species differences here where maybe more directional changes means that the fish is more exploratory or less directional changes could be more exploratory. Because again, directional changes are just a change in direction within a maze arm. So if a fish is showing less of them, they could still be doing lots of moving around. They're just not changing direction as much. So in this case, the bluehead chub seems to be changing direction a lot more when exposed to this fluoxetine drug. And so the takeaways from this part of my talk are that it's important to quantify fish movement within their environment. And we always need more data on how these small fishes are moving. Again, this is rife for people to study, in my opinion, uh, because there's just not as much known about how these small bodied non-game fish, which make up large portions of our fish communities are moving within their environments. And because humans have such a wide impact on freshwater systems, trying to understand how human effects such as contaminants like pharmaceuticals, like SSRIs and fluoxetine are impacting these fish is good to study because we're using native fishes and we can actually provide relevant data for understanding the toxic effects in nature a lot of times in toxicology, we like to use like zebrafish or fathead minnows as like these focal species that are always used for lab experiments, but it's sometimes hard to translate that data back to um, what's actually going on in nature. So for the second part of the talk here, I wanted to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about quantitative reasoning skills and some of the graphing uh, research that I'm doing here at Purdue. And so there is a study that was done by Cleveland they all, and they interviewed some introductory biology instructors and they asked them to think about these quantitative reasoning skills. And the instructors broke them into the sophisticated and basic quantitative reasoning skills. And so if I bring back up one of the graphs that I just showed you in the previous section, I just asked you the rhetorical question of what kind of skills do you need to be able to read this graph? there's probably a ton of different skills you could think of. And for this part, we're gonna be focusing on using descriptive statistics because I'm really interested in how students are understanding variability. But before we can talk about that, we need to talk about two terms that are constantly interchanged with each other. And this is variation and variability. The way I like to think about it from an ecology standpoint is variation is just this natural part of any population such as these models where we see there is a wide variation in the colors and patterns on their shells. But we can kind of measure the variation if we're collecting data to get this variability within the data that we collect. And variability can be low, medium or high as just broad terminology. And we can see this based on if we have around a mean value, there is not very much deviation, you likely have low variability. But if the data are gonna deviate a lot from that mean, then we have high variability. And so we're gonna look at some data that looks at three different questions. How do students interpret variability within treatments among different graph types? How do super students interpret error bars? And how can we use the graph a student makes to infer their knowledge on variability? 
And so again, here at Purdue, I work with this collaborative team. Uh, we work with Symbio, which is a company that has these kind of biology scenarios. And so we use their uh, software basically to create these graph smart scenarios that students take. And within the scenario, there's this question posed to students that ask them to look at these six graphs and interpret how easy or hard it is to interpret the amount of variability within the categories. And so within this drop down menu, they'll see it's easy to interpret, hard to interpret, not shown, or they're not sure. So they have to click one of those. And so we're just going to look at what are students, what, how are students answering this? So the first graph is what we're calling the raw bar graph. And students really like to make these graphs because they're not totally understanding why we need to aggregate data. They want to see every single data point. And so because of that, a lot of students tend to say this is easy to interpret. And again, this is aggregate data across uh, just over 1,700 students. If we look at this graph, which we call our categorical scatter plot, or B swarm plot is another way. There's a lot of different names for this type of graph. Students are not typically exposed to this type of graph in their classes. And so because of that, when they see this, they're a little unsure exactly how to read it. So that's one of the reasons we tend to see students say it's hard to interpret. But there is this split between hard and easy to interpret. And my undergrads that I work with here at Purdue and I are about to be doing some interviews this semester to kind of get at why students maybe struggle or don't struggle with interpreting variability in this type of graph. This is one of the graphs that students are exposed to a lot. Bar graphs, they're means with error bars. And so because of that, a lot of students say this is easy to interpret with the caveat that not all students exactly understand what the error bars mean, but they do see that it's showing some representation of variability. This question is, this graph is very interesting to me because it actually has a real right answer. All the other ones, you know, are so kind of subjective as instructors, we would say there are right answers, but it kind of does depend. For this graph, the, vari the variability is not shown. However, when students are reading this, only about 31% actually recognize that. And there could be an instance where students maybe are interpreting the question wrong, and maybe they're looking at variability between the treatments instead of within a treatment. And so that could result in a higher easy to interpret frequency. But overall, um, students do struggle to recognize that this actually doesn't show variability. And so one of the cool things about biology education research and education research in general is that you learn an entire new skill set. And this is called qualitative analysis. So a lot of times you think of a scientist, you think of bench work, field work, collecting data, and doing quantitative analysis, dealing with numbers. But here we're doing qualitative analysis, which is looking at students' responses. Like, what do they say? This could also, this also applies to interviews. We interview a lot of people. We interview students. And then we qualitatively analyze what they say within these interviews. And so here again, I work with two undergrads. Um, Anna and Kayla both started with me. Kayla did graduate last, last year. And so this academic year, I've been working with Anna and David. And so I'm just going to run through basically what did we find when students talk about error bars. So they have this question here that asks them, what type of information do the error bars provide you? And if they don't know, they're supposed to say, I do not know. But for students that do answer, my undergrads and I have created what we call a code book. So we read through all of these responses. We initially kind of try to group them together as we're reading them. Where do we see different words that students are always saying or phrases students are always saying? And then we do this over and over and again until we don't see any more differences. And so then this creates a code book. And then we can go back and actually recode all of the responses and see what are, what are students saying. So we have these four categories of the way students are answering this question. The first one are these all-encompassing terms. And so there's some examples here that will be on each slide. There'll be a couple of, of examples that go with each of these codes. Significance, so a student said that the error bars show if the data is significant or not. And so we have this code for significance because students tend to throw this word around. So in this case, the student says significance, but doesn't give us any context on what they mean. So that's why we put it with this, with this grouping here. 
And then, of course, variability in the data, variability alone, basically saying there's no context behind their use of the word variability. The next category are these terms of error. And so students talk about error in a bunch of different ways. This used to be a lot longer of a list. We've condensed it um, by having this error in experimentation where students talk about error in the context of either the experiment itself or recording a measurement or human error. So all of those aren't included in error and experimentation. And again, this error node context, it was either we didn't have the context or it could mean multiple things and we just didn't know what the student meant. So one of the things about qualitative analysis is you never wanna assume anything about what the student is saying, especially when you just have a written response from a student. You have to take it at face value. So if we as the coders cannot figure out exactly what the student is saying, when it comes to error, then it tended to get this code. And of course, a lot of students talk about accuracy and precision, margin of error, or just very generally error in the data. Our third category is this these purpose um, codes. And here, this is where students are talking about specific things that the error bars could mean. So standard deviation, standard error, confidence intervals, outliers. Some of them talk about what the data looks like. So in this case, it gives the audience a know of how far the data skews. So any kind of phrases or terminology that talks about what the data look like without specifically referencing um, let's say the error bars or standard deviation. There's also hypothesis testing. So this is again, this is when students talk about significance, but they're giving us context. So the error bars are overlapping and the difference in the numbers between the two groups is not significant. So they saying they're doing some kind of testing and they're giving context with it. Another popular purpose code is range. So students will say that the error bars tell us that the data can range anywhere from the top of the error bar to the bottom of it. So a lot of different ways students can say range, minimum, maximum, highest, lowest. Um, there's a lot of different phrases that we use for coding range. And lastly, we have trend analysis. So these are where students are recognizing that you need to have the mean in order to be able to look at the error bars. Um, the error bars can show you some distance from the mean. So we tend to look for this from the mean. And then the distance part can be a bunch of different phrases. So the example I pulled out here was the error bars provided the standard deviation, which is how far the data set lies from the mean. So not specifically saying distance, but in the way that they phrase it, meaning distance from the mean. Students will talk about comparison between the, in this case, the yes and no treatments, maybe the size of the error bars, if they're big or small, what does that mean? When they overlap, what does that mean? And some students will talk about a specific statistical test, though that is pretty rare. And so we have students complete these graph smart scenarios and we have six different ones that we have students complete. And within these graphing scenarios, students are actually making graphs. So we give them three different predictions, they're asked to make a graph for each prediction. And so I went in and wanted to see, well, can we look at what graphs students actually make and understand maybe how they would answer about variability at the end? So those variability questions are the last questions that they answer. They're making graphs beforehand. And so here we have, again, this bar graph with error bars that students are answering an error bar question, I wanted to pick a prediction from each of the scenarios that would ultimately, if students made a graph correctly, would make a graph that looked like this. And I wanted to look at how does the graph they make compare to how they answer the drop-down question and then how they answer that open-ended question at the end about error bars. And so this just gives you a breakdown of the different graphs that students created. So when we say a raw bar graph, that's a graph that looks something like this. When we say a bar graph with a mean, that's just aggregating the data but not putting error bars on the graph. Error bar mean plus error bars, that's gonna be your graph that looks like the one that they're interpreting for that open-ended question. A quantitative scatter plot is where a student, in this case, actually picked a wrong variable. So the prediction asks for a categorical 
versus a quantitative variable, but they pick two quantitative. So you have your quintessential scatter plot with a bunch of points on the graph. Or they actually created a categorical scatter plot, which is that graph that looks like this, that some students don't recognize are, um, that some students have trouble interpreting. And so for this data, we have the graph that students made on the x-axis, and then the y-axis is showing you the frequency of student responses. So the graph on the left-hand side of your screen is showing the graph the student is interpreting in the drop-down question. And so if we look at the bar graph data, we can see that students that made a raw bar graph or one that looked very similar to what they were interpreting were more likely to say that the raw bar graph was easy to interpret in terms of variation within the treatment. But the ease of reading actually decreases as students make what instructors would call a better graph, right? We don't want students to graph raw data. We want them to graph averages and then show variability on their graphs. So the ultimate graph would be something like a mean with, with error bars. But you might say, oh, like we like to show raw data for some stuff. So cats, categorical scatter plots are also a good way to show raw data and also see the variation. But again, students struggle with that. So we weren't seeing the same trends with students that were actually choosing to graph categorical scatter plots. But we were seeing this interesting trend with students that chose to make bar graphs. And the more sophisticated or correct their bar graphs got, uh, the less likely they were to say that this was easy to read. And so we see this kind of similar pattern, though it's not as strong with this graph, just because again, a lot of students are exposed to this graph, where students that make this graph say it's easy to read, so the pink is easy to read and it's decreased um, for the students that just made raw bar graphs. For this graph where variability was not shown, again, if we look at the blue, so the blue is the not shown frequency, that frequency does increase based on how students made their graphs, which was interesting. If we look at the open-ended question, I analyzed this data based on those broad categories I showed you. So in this case, that was all encompassing our broad terms. And here we can see students actually use more broad terms more frequently when they're aggregating the data. And I think what's going on here is that students, they're not just using the, the all encompassing terms, they're using those terms and they're also using some of the other codes that we saw. For error, we see that it tends to very slightly decrease. So students talk less about general error when they graph either a mean or a mean with error bars. But we see it really increases for students that that graphed quantitative scatter plots. And again, the, if they graphed a quantitative scatter plot, they graphed an incorrect variable. So their graph really wasn't correct. So students that maybe struggle with graphing a little bit tend to talk more about error bars just in terms of error. And lastly, we have this purpose. And and uh, purpose is increasing when we see students with bar graphs and with aggregate data, as well as uh, means with error bars, those tend to increase compared to those students that just make a raw bar graph. And so for our takeaways here, Students have a wide range of ways to explain variability. Students may not always recognize when variability is shown on a graph. And again, us as instructors, that's just something that we might not always be aware of. And practice and repetition is important. So one of the reasons that we study this is because a lot of instructors sometimes assume that students know how to use this, how to, how to do these things. Students know how to make graphs. Students know how to interpret graphs. Students know how to interpret variability. But students struggle. And so as instructors, we need to realize that and figure out what are the best strategies to use to help students gain these skills um, to be successful. And I did realize we were going close to time, but yes, so I'm happy to take any questions that you have um, about anything um, based on uh, the time that we have left. Awesome, thank you so much for doing that. So fascinating. I, I love the research and I love the, the educational part too, Lauren. This is uh, really, really neat stuff.
in terms of the toxicology and the behavior, the fish behavior, I mean, what it, is this? Is this something that we can continue to perfect in order to improve water usage, water reclamation, uh, water reusage, uh, and and that that kind of approach? Uh, where where do you see us going with with this type of research? Yeah, so I think part of this research has just shown that wastewater treatment plants tend to need to be upgraded. And so there are instances where um, municipalities will spend the money to upgrade their uh, wastewater treatment plants to what we call tertiary treatment. It's basically this extra step that not all treatment plants have that probably still isn't 100% accurate, but does a much better job at getting all of these contaminants out of the water. Yeah. Um, just so that, again, we're trying not to release um, as many things as we can back into the environment. I know no, no. Uh, in general, wastewater is fairly clean. Uh, there, were, When I was in high school, actually, we got to go to a wastewater treatment plant in Erie, and they'll just drink water out of, like, they'll take a cup, and they'll put it in, and they'll just drink the water right in front of you that goes back out into the lake. And so the idea is that the water is safe, um, but it does contain just even these small amounts that are actually can affect our aquatic our aquatic life and so for sure uh, continuing to do testing is yeah. one of the ba- main things to do and, and behavior well, is one of those aspects we can test. yeah and you know comparatively speaking maybe the fish uh, the dosage exposure is not as broad as the microbes and the other smaller uh animals that might be out there that might be experiencing a higher dosage it's so interesting. And also, just because I'm interested I, also in water purification for space travel. And like, I know today they they sent up the 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 next lunar lander here to uh, to see what what uh, what we could do to set up shop back again in the moon. And uh, it, your your study uh, absolutely took me there thinking, well, you know, we really need to make sure that the water, if we're going to be reusing water, uh, that that it's got to be safe and it's going to be uh, safe to drink. The other piece is, and I know we're at the hour mark here, so I don't want to take too much longer, but I was so fascinated about the graphing questions because to me, I think students really start to understand this once they start getting statistics uh, underway, especially the questions that you had between variation and variability. And, you know, what, what, is, this, is this very much tied to recommendations that you would make to any statistics course, which would be to teaching graphing in a new way to teach other other techniques for understanding and interpreting graphs? I think it's tied to both. So I think students are afraid of statistics sometimes, and so they wait to take it. And I do know that that, that is true for bio students here at Purdue. They tend to wait till their senior year to take statistics, and it would be better for them if they could take it their sophomore year or like second semester sophomore year so that they can gain that knowledge, and then they're constantly going to be using it in their classes. So not just teaching it in statistics, yeah. but also having instructors comfortable enough to teach it within again, from a bio perspective, within a bio class. Like, yeah. don't just learn it in statistics and then, oh, I took statistics, it's over. Like, no, these are skills that you're going to learn and need to use within all of your right. classes, as long as the classes are actually teaching it. And that's where that repetition part comes in. The more but I do I, this, the more yeah. comfortable they'll get. And I, I agree with you. I, I wish I would have had a teacher like you when I was taking statistics, because I remember you know, I took stats and the first one, the first class was mainly, okay, how do you do the calculations? How do you calculate the mean? How do you calculate this? How do you calculate that? But never really from the experimental design approach really until the second stats course that that we took. And which is where I think these graphs really come to life. Um, and I I wish they would flip things around and tell you, first, look, 
this is why we're going to be doing these and learning these calculations. But if you really want to know what's the variability, this is what you need to find out and how much and what and all of these names that we throw around. And it seems to me like you have quite a strong grasp on statistics to be able to now start to understand the education process and how students are taking it in. Yeah, I would hope I, I, especially ecology, anyone who wants to do ecology, it's not just going out in the field and like playing <laughs> with fish. It's a very statistical heavy field. And yes. so if you wanted to do statistics or you want to do ecology, like you're going to need to know statistics. It's just, they, they go together. So yes. uh, I'd like to think I have a good, strong foundation and um, hopefully again, wherever I end up teaching wise, uh, I'm excited to make sure all my students know their quantitative reasoning skills. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate the time that you've taken to tell us a little bit about your journey to so exciting and to tell us a little bit about your work and how you're balancing both the education and the research uh, side of things. So, so exciting. Thank you, Lauren Stachinsky, Dr. Stachinsky from the Department of Biological Sciences. Thank you for providing us with your lecture today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All the best. Have a great day. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.